What's up everyone? Jay again here for another episode of Jay Walking. And yeah. today, I have a special guest. He is a colleague of mine and a friend, but I wanted to listen to him more and know him more as he introduced himself. So, here's Sir Jeremy. Hi everyone. So, welcome to Jay Walking. Welcome, especially to the first episode of this podcast. To my viewers out there, thank you so much for subscribing to Nocturnal Sage. And also thank you to Jay, Walk Jay Walker for gracing me with another opportunity to add something to my playlist on special topics. Basically, I'm a teacher in the Philippines. I teach senior high school. Most of the time, I'm tasked to coach students on oral communication, reading, and writing skills. And during my free time, I write stories as well as essays in my diary Aside from that, I'm also musically inclined. I sing and I play the guitar for our praise and worship band. So for today, I think um, I should give the microphone back to Jay Walker to introduce the topic that we'll discourse on. Thank you, uh, Jeremy, for your introduction. So, uh, for this episode, for this uh, podcast, and by the way, this is also available in Sir Jeremy's YouTube channel, The Nocturnal Sage. So, you can also view this podcast on his YouTube channel. So, uh, we are actually basically teachers and we do have the same love for, for liter literature, philosophy, music even. And for this episode, we are going to talk something more about philosophy and especially the philosophy of a iconic philosopher, if I say, if I may say so. Yes. And uh, his philosophy has influenced a lot of individuals. Yes. And inspired a lot of of people. Mm -hmm. And we are going to talk about. The philosopher, I think the first challenge is to pronounce his name. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, the totally. first ch challenge is to pronounce, especially to philosophers. Yeah. So we are talking about the philosopher Friedrich, uh, how will you pronounce your na first name again? Uh, Friedrich. Friedrich Nietzsche. 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 So, uh, if you are into philosophy and if you want to know more about this guy, Friedrich Nietzsche, this is the right place and if you're watching this one in Nocturnal Sage, it's the right time for you to learn more about the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. So, Sir Jeremy, hmm? tell us about uh, this philosopher and why do you have an inclination to his philosophy? Okay, first off, Friedrich Nietzsche is just one of the many existentialist philosophers out there. We have what we call atheistic existentialists and um, theistic existentialists. Nietzsche is atheistic because he does not believe in any reliance on a higher being. In our case, majority of us believe in God, right? So he advises in his philosophy that we ought to live our life, our lives independent of God, whether or not he truly exists. On the other hand, theistic philosophers like Soren Kierkegaard have advocate a leap of faith. In order to live one's life fully, we have to, you know, succumb to faith. Since, yes, it also believes that faith is meaningless, but it uses the meaninglessness to believe. But the atheistic counterparts, they refuse to do so because just like uh, though Camus, okay, he is another proponent of existentialism, but he actually re refuses the label 
since he considers himself he considered himself a novelist more than a philosopher but in his novels you can see the same property he advocates living one's life independent of any submission to a higher being now the higher being need not necessarily be god it can be actually any belief system you know even belief systems like um the famous ones you you only live once yolo so even that in itself is a belief system one can make a god out of that so i think that is one way of defining or describing nietzsche on a universal scale now your, as for your follow-up question, why am I into such philosopher? Okay, for, uh, first off, I like his writing style. You know, you should read some of his works titled Beyond Good and Evil, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and the other one called Gay Science, though I myself have not read that, but it sounds cool. So if you want to be entertained, you read Nietzsche, even if the one that you really read is mere is a mere translation of the original German. But nonetheless, even if it's just translated, you can sense his spirit, his lively spirit in his writings. And a second, my second reason for liking Nietzsche, well, his reasoning, though it can yes, it can be problematic his reasoning echoes with my nature because i myself even even before i heard of nietzsche's philosophy i had believed in being autonomous making decisions for myself because i believed that no one else would do that and i see it actually work in my life i actually believe in something if i can see its functional value if it makes me grow if it makes me happier more powerful then I am more likely to believe that code, whether or not, regardless of whoever thought of it. So, in this case, Nietzsche is the one who thought of that. That's why I am rooting for him. Oh, well, Jeremy, uh, I guess knowing you, you are a Christian, right? Yes. But how do you reconcile that being a Christian and at the same time also embracing some of the highlights and the importance of Nietzsche's philosophies. How do you reconcile that one? Since some of Nietzsche's philosophies, I think you agree with this, that some of his philosophies are anti-Christians. How will you reconcile to that thing? Oh, I thank you for that question. Now, let me first clarify my understanding of Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think Nietzsche is not necessarily disproving the existence of God, of Jesus Christ. No, he's, he actually acknowledges that th these entities, objectively speaking, uh, do, can, they can exist. It's possible that there's a God. But what he is particularly attacking is the, I think, the practice of the faith, not really, the, not really faith in itself. That's my impression of Nietzsche. Now, here's how I reconcile that. Okay? So, one of his seemingly anti-Christian statements is God is dead. Which is actually, the I think, the most famous, no? Yes. But what he means by God is dead is that God is merely a construct. A construct made by us humans through language. And, you know, through language, we can actually modify or nullify the existence of something. Now, one common evidence is the sun, we call it the sun, the one up there, the one that's providing us light right now. But have you ever come to think of it? Did the sun say that it is the sun? Did the moon say that it is the moon? No, right? Who provided these labels? So applying that principle in the talk on God, who decides what God does? Who decides that God hates, okay, considers, let's say, for example, homosexuality, which is heavily condemned by the Christian church? Who said that it's a sin? Okay, so that is Nietzsche's premise, the nature of language. Language is the, really the one that enables us to 
define things the way we want them to and to match them with our perception. So actually it is through that principle that I am still able to reconcile his thought with my Christian beliefs. Now, my religion, okay, is evangelical Protestantism. In our doctrine, we emphasize the, the act of sharing the gospel, the good news of salvation, that Christ died for our sins. But personally, as a practitioner of the faith, I don't emulate what most do. I actually, yes, I may have been brought up in the church, but I do not agree with all the practices that my predecessors are doing. Like, for example, emphasizing talking about the faith over practicing Christian values. I'd rather practice Christian values than boast about my knowledge of especially the Bible and you know the different stories, the different names that can be found there. I don't find it quite functional to be knowledgeable about the Bible and yet not practice the, the values that Jesus teaches in the Bible. So that is how I reconcile Nietzschean philosophy with my being a Christian. It is through this. Even if it is true, it may it can be true that God is the nature of God is dependent on human language. Even if it if that is true, I myself still choose to believe in God, even if he may turn out to be made just made just uh, made up of just uh, mere language. I will still believe in him because, um, well, it's faith, you know. If it's faith, it's not directed by reasoning. So, if we're if one is looking for reconciliation between these values, okay, we have an atheistic philosophy and Christianity here. So it seems that they're mutually exclusive, but. It's up to the practitioner to find a way to bridge those two. So my way, yes, I, I can concede that God is made up of language, can be made up of language, but I will still choose to believe in him because it's what my my instincts tell me to do. I think it's I think this is where the test of spirituality comes in, despite all these rational musings. Would you be swayed into giving up your faith mm -hmm. or not? So I think it all depends on you as the individual, how you choose to absorb these concepts. So that is what I do. I Yes, I validate both. Okay, I validate both in order to, you know, move on with my life. Okay, uh, thank you for those things you have just shared, Sir Jeremy. Well, I think let's go back to the... The one you have shared where uh, talking about language and, and how language can be used as a system for human beings to create a certain uh, reality, okay? But, uh, well, that's, I think that's the power of language, right? Yes. So that language could point out to something real, something imaginary, or a concept but uh, don't you also uh, do you have this challenge in you or you wrestle within your faith how you practice your faith especially you said that you are an evangelical protestant uh, protestant and then uh, knowing also the the philosophies of Nietzsche uh, are there also challenges along the way that you been through uh, despite knowing the philosophies of Nietzsche deeply were there some challenges struggles like relating probably to to your church mates relating to your to your elders or other people well based on my daily encounter with these people there were okay there was one occasion in which um, my cousin when I was teaching in Sunday school he questioned one of my messages 
because I teach Sunday school classes mm -hmm. too. Now, I've been teaching for um, eight years already in wow. Sunday school. Now, going back to that scenario, he did once comment something like, you know, parang mali yung sinabi mo tungkol sa, I think I was talking about mm -hmm. the act of spreading the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I think I inadvertently used uh, an irrelevant term. I think I used the term marketing because what I was trying to imply at that time, um, if we want to share the gospel more, more effectively, we should do something more than employ mere language. We should we should um, practice the faith, something like that. And I think he misinterpreted what I said about the way I understood the Great Commission, the, the one stated it at the end of Matthew, Matthews. go and make disciples of all nations. That is actually the core of our doctrine. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, I, I think he just... Um, what, he just got confused with what I said when I dropped the term marketing. It's just like, I just um, made an analogy to marketing that, you know, the way people, if people nowadays market their products more than, you know, creatively, we should also do the same. So we should do something more than just talk about Jesus. We should actually live the way Jesus did in order to convince people of the good news of salvation. I think this is just the, the error I observed in our church. Most people would talk about the faith, but when you look at the way they treat others, yes, they don't seem to really um, practice the values that Jesus taught in the Bible. They, they, yes, they are knowledgeable, but they don't, their actions are inconsistent with what they're teaching. And I personally don't want to be like them. So that is one of the challenges that I'm facing. What can I do? okay to um forward the kind of practice that people should undertake in our church mm -hmm. it's going to be difficult in my in my case because it seems that i'm the only one who reads nietzschean philosophy and the one who subscribes to it and who's able to reconcile it even mm -hmm. with um christian principles it's hard because most people around me, especially my parents, I could sense that they may really practice the faith for the reason that they are going to get saved, mm -hmm. okay, via the rupture. But uh, that's not my, I think, the emphasis of Christianity. Right now, I have reached the point in which I no longer am obsessed with being saved. I am more like into helping others get saved. Sharing the gospel, yeah, and see, even if I uphold the Chian values, I, at the same time, believe that I am somewhat active in fulfilling the Great Commission given by Jesus Christ. Even though I do not use language the way they do, or like, what do you know what they do on the bus, yes. right? They will, a random missionaries will, would go up the bus and get up on the preach bus. Preach the and, gospel. Yes, preach the gospel and then hand, um, distribute those, envelopes. Yes. You know, even if I don't do that, I, I believe that through the way I live, through the way I, like, uh, giving my time for students, um, teachers, uh, and other colleagues in the community, and also outside our, you know, our institution, I believe that um, even if I don't use the word Jesus, I can still preach the gospel through other means. Mm -hmm. So that is where the philosophy of DJ comes in. You know, language, we can use it to nullify or modify. And I choose to, yes, I choose to do it the way God intends me to do it because I, I don't think God created us uh, you know, with, in a, with the same function. We have different functions. And like for instance, my function is in the literary arts and in the performing arts. That's why I, I devote most of the time to these fields. Now, this one, what we're doing, actually can be a medium in itself, right? To spread the good news of salvation. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Well, I think let's go back to the one you just shared. You said 
uh, you use the term marketing. Well, I think what you're trying to refer is about uh, the evangelization, okay? Yes. To, to evangelize people. And, and uh, in the world today, there is actually a need, just you have shared the things like that towards the end of your sharing. Uh, there's a need for a new evangelization, okay? Um, well, that's a, also a, an analogy, especially in the business world, marketing. And also, I think going back to the one you have said a while ago that uh, there is a, a dichotomy, if we say so, a dichotomy to, I think this is also the challenge today, especially to Christians or even to believers in, in any faith, yeah. that there's a challenge between what you know and what you live, your, your lifestyle, the way you live. Uh, it, is, it doesn't always follow that what you know means that's what you live live yes. out okay and especially for christians that is always a a challenge and probably that's one of the reasons why uh, nietzsche in the gay science uh, said his famous words that uh, god is dead okay uh, it is not a celebratory remark but it is uh, there is now a a a weak weak point of people in the faith to put God into their daily ordinary lives and I think uh, even up to today that's a challenge what do you say about it so. yeah we are already in the new age and in the new age people do one of two things first they let go of their christian principles if not christian well we can have other religions in the picture and the second option is to redefine faith yes i think aside from those who totally gave up their theistic beliefs we have those, the other batch, that chooses to redefine it, redefine their faith on their own terms. Now, there is this debate about hill songs. I think most Christian songs are popularized by hill songs nowadays because um, based on observation, their, their music, the marketing of their videos, especially via YouTube, is remarkable. Now, there, I saw this video about Hillsong saying that the, the, the songs of Hillsong are not really aligned with what is written in the Bible, but instead, Hillsong merely in, introduces a new type of spiriticism because they it seems that they interpret god based on worldly um worldly perspectives it's like the it's the fulfillment i think of what nietzsche has stated god is dead therefore if i could make an extension for him through language we can choose to resurrect him and then remake him into what we want him to be based on our own terms i think that is what the the video that i watched is trying to imply though i have not watched the video completely yet based on the caption i could sense that it echoes nietzsche's perspective that people would believe for a long time in a certain god and then after a few years, after a few decades, centuries, someday they will get tired of God and sin and will resort to new toys to play with. Okay, that is the, I'm borrowing the analogy from Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. Sometimes man needs new toys aside from God and sin. So nowadays, that's uh, my observation of people. They either forget about the faith or they choose to redefine faith, mold it, uh, excuse me, mold it according to their preference. 
to mold the faith according to to their preference. But don't you think also, uh, Sir Jeremy, that there's a danger to that uh, to that belief uh, if we if we look in its final causality? Do you think that there's a danger to that kind of thinking to mold the the faith into their preference? Don't you think that faith becomes now um, relative? Okay, speaking of danger, I think I, what I see is merely diaspora. Mm -hmm. I think that is the, if someone would assume that there's a danger in molding the faith according to one's aesthetic views, what, which is, uh, what is beautiful, what is good, and what's not. I think it's only, it only repeats the reality of diaspora. When we, when, I, when we say diaspora, we're referring to the spreading of people, of cultures into different parts of the world, right? Now, when it comes to belief systems, I think there is this implicit diaspora in which Okay, a group of people will enlist themselves, let's say, to Protestantism. Now, Protestantism can actually, right, right now, it also has a number of denominations. Mm -hmm. Aside from Evangelical, we also have the a Baptist. A number right? of denominations, exactly. actually. Already thousands of denominations, I think. Yes. So, I think that's also, uh, already that's, that in itself is a manifestation of the implicit diaspora I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. So, I think if ever the diaspora is a danger to some, I think it's merely a condition mm -hmm. of the way human beings glorify certain belief systems. Because right off the bat, even before the new age arrived, mm -hmm. okay, let's consider this, the Bible, which is the, the sole author, which is uh, considered the, the sole authority in our doctrine. Mm -hmm. We're, we have this sola scriptura mm -hmm. thing in our doctrine. Mm -hmm meaning we only rely on what's written in the Bible. Bible. Okay. What is not written is not true. We only rely on what is written black and white mm -hmm. in the Bible. Now let's consider that. Mm -hmm. Okay, some actually have questioned that doctrine by stating, okay, who decided, who decided which book to place in the Bible? Isn't it human minds too? So how is that different from the deuterocanonicals, which are being refused by our Bible scholars to admit into our version of the Bible. Because in the Protestant world, the deuterocanonicals are rejected. Mm -hmm. They're not, yeah, yes, they're not be considered part of the Bible. And I inquired about that with some of my co-members and they told me it's because those books, um, they extol self-esteem. They extol uplifting the human state more than christening God. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, I did, I did skim some of the pages in those deuterocanonicals. And though when I did that, I only, the last time I viewed a deuterocanonical book was um, when I was in high school. And I don't particularly remember any um, any verse from the Jeter canonical mm -hmm. maybe because at that time when I was a kid I was uh, a devout Christian I've always been a devout Christian but before hearing of Nietzsche I was also dogmatic about my faith so mm -hmm. I got influenced by the dogmatism in our church and I only overcame that upon understanding Nietzsche more so I've been set free from the dogmatism mm -hmm. so going back I think having um, people transforming or molding the faith into their own preference is not really a danger. It's merely a reality, a manifestation of how human beings think, mm -hmm. I believe. The pattern of valuing things, which is, by the way, unaccounted for. You know, in schools, people take religion classes, mm -hmm. values education classes, but has it ever been taught, has, the, has, a, has a school ever taught students how values in themselves are formed, how these faiths are transformed into belief systems? I think 
the new age manifestation, okay, when people redefine faith according to their own terms, simply teaches us, yes, it's a hurtful reality because if, let's say, in one church, there are those people who deviate from the status quo, who will, who will forward their own versions of the faith. Okay, that is against the doctrine, right? It's actually, the, the perception of danger comes from the insecurity that the, that the church will lose some of its members. Mm -hmm. And if it does lose some of its members, it will become weaker. I think, yes, it's simply fear that, um, that perpetuates the existence of this danger. But if you have overcome that fear of you know, losing members in an institution, I think you will not consider the diaspora a danger. Mm -hmm. But uh, in connection to the things that you have just uh, shared, how will we also reconcile uh, the things you have just said to Jesus' prayer in the Gospel of John, uh, in his prayer during the, the Last Supper, uh, he said in one of his prayers, that they may be one. How are we going to, to reconcile to that idea? In Jesus' words, that they may be one. Well, aside from his prayer that the people become one, there's also another statement in, I don't know if it's from the same gospel mm -hmm. book, but I remember the statement in which Jesus claimed he came to the world not to unify people, but to actually divi divide them. Mm -hmm. yeah, so when Jesus prayed that they may be one, I think at the back of Jesus' mind, he's making uh, his request is simply expressed out of love for the world even if it will not be because there were jesus also made other requests like if this cup can be taken away from me if it's possible that i will not be crucified right he made that request his human instincts had him make that request yet he did not insist that it be granted right so when i interpret his prayer some of his requests in his in that prayer like may they be one, he knows that may, there will be people who will turn their backs against Christianity. There will be people who would persecute his disciples. That's actually an evi already evident in the Acts of the Apostles. Mm -hmm. Peter, you know, he got persecuted. Mm -hmm. Paul, even if there will be those who will not agree with the faith, they will actually, yes, there are some who directly oppose God. He still made that prayer because simply out of love for the world. He doesn't really expect that it would happen. I think, yes, Jesus, uh, God is all-knowing, right? Yes, we believe yes. in that. Now, even if he had known that this is the kind of world that we would be in, he had still made that request just to express how much he wants all, if possible, to be saved. But... If we look at Revelation, there are, you know, in some of his parables, there's already this prophecy that mm -hmm. those seated, uh, those placed in his, on, on his right will, will go to heaven, and while those on the left will go to hell. So, yeah, just, it's just out of love. That's why he made that request. Okay. So, uh, let's go back to the philosopher, okay, Nietzsche. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I think uh, that is already in into our pop culture right now. Into yes. songs, into t-shirt, into um, the entertainment industry. Yeah. What can you say about this one? Could you try to, to explain this one more? Uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That is actually words coming from Nietzsche. We all have different trials. We encounter struggles, disagreeable situations like failing a test, difficult people like people who constantly change their minds, people who criticize you. According to Nietzsche, 
these conditions are uh, ought to be loved. People who give us kind words, who tell us that, oh, you know, you don't need to change. You're fine just the way you are. For him, they're not true friends. He'd rather have people who tell us our imperfections, who will challenge us in order for us to become the better versions of ourselves. So what doesn't kill you makes you stronger refers to those pains in life that we want to wish away. But the, that quote encourages us not to. Even if we do wish them away, they would never go away. The, pro the more our problems will stay. And those problems don't actually kill us. They hurt us, but they don't necessarily kill, kill us. Okay. If we really want those pains to go away, then the only answer, well, is death. I think, as a matter of fact, it's really death. Okay, <laughs> I remember. I, I remember that movie. I don't know if you have watched that movie entitled Whiplash. Have you heard of that movie? Whiplash? Whiplash. Oh, no. Um, it's actually a story of a jazz drummer and okay. he has a music coach and the coach was he was an he was a an angry man he's a perfectionist uh, music coach and then he would do this annoying thing whenever the main character the drummer would play his uh, routines in his drums and for for that musical coach would always say, not quite my tempo. Uh, he was sort of like the, uh, the person who represents those people who would always challenge us, uh, would, would uh, try to, uh, how do you say, stretch out our patience, okay? And, well, I think that's uh, one thing. You say you, doesn't kill you, makes you stronger, okay? Those uh, challenging moments, those ch challenging people, difficult people, or difficult situations. These are these may this will not kill us physically, but uh, these are challenges that will that will make us grow more and mm. uh, overcome. I think that's the word which we're trying to look for because uh, I think in Nietzsche's uh, philosophy is more on the self overcoming. Ubermensch. Ubermensch. Mm. The Superman. What do you want to share more about this answer? In psychology, there is the unconscious mind, right? According to this Spark Note that I have read, I'm not sure. And though I'm not sure if it's Smoop or Sparks uh, Spark Note, but these psychologists owe it to Nietzsche because Nietzsche was the first one to popularize the idea of the unconscious. Referring back to the Superman, inside a human being, there are different drives. You notice that in your everyday decision making, you want to do this, but at the same time, you don't want to do it. A part of you tells you to do that, a part of you tells you not to. So that is already a clear manifestation of the unconscious mind. That is the context of the Superman, because the, according to Nietzsche, the Superman is someone who has overcome the, you know, the conflict between these drives, drives. And yes, this makes me remember Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil quote. Mm -hmm. A man who is born multicultural, you know, this is a paraphrase, who has many races, Okay, with mixed, yeah, yes, mixed ethnicities in him, will turn out to be the weakest. And you know his reason? Because he will someday wish to end the war that he is. So he defines the human being as a war. Each of us is a war of different wills, different drives. And that, is, that leads to his central concept, the will to power. The will to power is the state where these different wills, different drives, try to attain dominance. Mm -hmm. You notice that in our everyday decision making, there is there will always be one choice that will dominate over the others. Actually, for example, here in at, uh, in this moment, mm -hmm. we could have chosen not to do this podcast, yes. right? That's one of the many wills that were against the other wills like oh, we need that there's the urge to check, there's mm -hmm. the urge to take a nap, the urge to listen to music, to watch a good video other than this. 
but or to watch uh, the <laughs> nocturnal sage and exactly YouTube, exactly <laughs> or to listen to my podcast <laughs> yes yes those are some of the choices that we're at war before we're doing this but which choice dominated obviously it's this one so that is the exemplification of nietzsche's will to power the will to power is simply a battle be uh, between drives and it's not Focus only on, unlike what the Nazis have glamorized. It's not about killing another person or mm -hmm. proving your or, strength over another person. To become violent just to get your desires, I think. Mm, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not that. It's not just that. Okay, so it's more on these, uns yeah, undocumented, unaccounted for mm -hmm. wills, urges inside of our psychology in our psyche that he's referring to okay thanks for that clarification okay the ubermensch well i think i'm glad that you mentioned the psychology because well, i think uh, that's one thing i i admire although i am not that adept to the philosophies of nietzsche but one thing i admire into his thoughts and into his reflections and philosophies is that uh, he has a a a connection to to interiority okay i think one one time he said there was no philosopher uh, before who's also a psychologist mm. well, i think he mentioned that one and yes uh, i think uh, his thoughts also affected famous psychologists like uh, freud i think yes freud, yes. He, freud was very much influenced by nietzsche even Carl Jung, and uh, there. Uh, well, I think, sir, if you're, if I'm going to relate this self overcoming, I think this is one value that we need today, in reference to the mental state of people today. Mm -hmm. You know, um, men, there's a, actually a mental health crisis right now. And do you think that uh, this thought of uh, self overcoming of Nietzsche would Please help these people. I do certainly believe that it would. Because if a person is determined to go through the conflict between his or her drives, to make the decision to continue living, dominate over the decision to stop living, mm -hmm. I think it will it will lessen the suicide rates in the world. Well, if you ask Nietzsche's opinion about suicide, I think he's, he's been silent about that. Actually, though, if you read his quotes on joy, on, mm -hmm. because he, in the spoke Zarathustra, he mentions there's something like, pure joy only wants eternity. Mm -hmm. He mentions the eternal recurrence, the state where all of what we do will eventually cycle back into what they had been. Mm -hmm. So there will be a repetition of the events in our lives. Now, I think that uh, whether or not it's true is not the point. But what I think he's trying to emphasize there is that we should continue to, yeah, we should cherish living despite the pains of our lives, even if we're encountering so many messes in our lives so many crises. Such kind of life deserves to be loved. So if you ask Nietzsche, if you'd be given to live once again, but as in live with the same condition, same family background, same crisis, same problems, would he do it? He'd tell you, oh yes, I'll do it. It's the eternal recurrence. I will not trade my life in for a replacement because nothing would compare to this kind of life that mm -hmm. I'm living. Okay, so you have mentioned uh, you have mentioned about his, his family's background. Well, I think uh, this is just a you know a question about his background. I think uh, I don't know, but uh, Nietzsche had a difficult uh, family background also in his professional life? When I read his biography, the only difficulty that I saw there was his constant, I'm not sure if it can be classified as overthinking, but 
I read a line there that reads, because he could not stop his thinking, he eventually left university despite his being tenured mm -hmm. and then isolated himself to write what would become later on his books Oops. that we are reading right now. So I think that's his only difficulty. Nietzsche's observation that people, you know, have lost track of what they value and eventually they need to re have a revaluation of all their principles mm -hmm. so that they can live, live life anew with vigor, you know, with, with joy, like what he puts it in the in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Okay, so thank you. So, um, we are going to, to end this episode right now. But before we end, Sir Jeremy, yeah. any, any words of encouragement or any words of wisdom? Because, you know, Jaywalking is a podcast. This podcast is created to, to uh, in search for a life meaning, and for wisdom, and for depth. So what are some of the words you could encourage to our listeners and for the watchers of your your subscribers yeah. and followers in your Nocturnal Sage YouTube channel. I'd encourage everyone to take the challenge of considering as true your own thoughts. We are surrounded by different people, different elements that would refute whatever we really value. So I strongly encourage everyone to bloom where you are planted. Where you are is where you ought to be. Whatever situation you may be in, it may not be perfect. Actually, take advantage of the imperfection because it's only through the imperfection that would make you stronger, just like how the lines in that song go. You know, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. Even if the soil sometimes becomes dry, you can always find ways to fertilize the soil. So it actually doesn't matter which job or profession you are in. What matters the most, this is my personal motto as an artist myself. The creation of my character is higher than my books. So continue that process of self, of, yeah, of recreation, of overcoming. Because the moment you wish for it to stop, it's like wishing for life to end. But again, I want to rely more on what Nietzsche wants his readers to digest. This kind of life, each of us, this kind of life that we're in, deserves to be loved. Well, I love the last word, the last words to be loved, okay? And at the end of the day, it's <coughs> all about love anyway, right? Yeah. Do you agree, sir? Okay. Yes. So that is the end of our episode in Jaywalking. I hope that you have enjoyed our conversation and you have picked some important pieces and could hopefully apply in your life, especially if you are having some crisis or conflicts. We are praying for you and hopefully we, that you are as you listen to this podcast that you are doing well okay and also if you're watching this on uh, nocturnal sage sage youtube channel thank you everyone thank you jay worker jay walkers and see you on the next episode okay, bye bye